literally with thousands of abstracts being presented back to back at ASH and then at SABCS 2025, it felt like we were drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> Our job with these discussion is to cut through the noise and focus on key studies. Hello and welcome back to the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rahul Gosain, a practicing community medical oncologist. And as always, I'm here with my brother and your co-host, Rohit Gosain. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are diving into key highlights from ASH 2025, focusing on acute myeloid leukemia and chronic myeloid leukemia space. To help us unpack these practice-changing and practice-informing abstracts, we are excited to welcome back Dr. Jorge Cortez from the Georgia Cancer Center. Jorge, thanks so much for joining us again. My pleasure. I always enjoy these conversations. Jorge, welcome. All right, we'll start off with AML and the studies around hypomethylating agents and venetoclax in the space, and then close off with CML and the recent updates around Isiminib in the space. Perfect. Let's start off with one of the plenary discussions, Paradigm Study, which is a phase two study comparing our historic 7 plus 3 induction chemo versus azacitidine and venetoclax upfront for intermediate or high risk FLT3 wild type AML in fit patients. Or can you touch on this study and its findings? Yeah, sure. The, uh, this was a remarkable study, very interesting, and there was a lot of conversation about it. So as you mentioned, these were patients that were considered fit for chemotherapy. But I think what you mentioned is important. It did not include corbinding factor leukemias, so the favorable risk. It did not include FLT3. It did not include the NPM1, which is a good prognostic factor, unless they were older than 60. So those patients were excluded. And then they were randomized to receive intensive chemotherapy. Most of them were 3 plus 7, but there were some that were CPX, 351, or receive ASA venetoclax. Then they continued the treatment as they got a second induction if they got intensive chemotherapy, continuation with ASA, then consolidations and, and transplant whenever possible. What they showed is that the outcomes were, in terms of safety, much better for the, for the ASAP yes. fewer infections, fewer, you know, less bleeding, less mortality. The overall response rate was also better for the patients treated with the ASAP and, and that was the case also for the event-free survival. So very interesting data because uh, we've always considered this a treatment for the for the patients that are not fit for chemotherapy. But, but now this these starts to, to question, you know, is it applicable for, for more patients than, than just the non-fit for chemotherapy? Very important study. Obviously, we still need to, to learn more. And th there's been pre previous studies, by the way. You know, they, they, the last year there was a single arm study that showed very attractive results that kind of mirror these, but it was a single arm. Here you have a comparator and it's very attractive. Right, Hori. What you mentioned is attractive because of the fact that we are including fit patients, mainly for intermediate and poor risk. A few things to keep in mind from what we learned from this. First of all, this is a phase two study. Though HMA and venetoclax combination has been utilized as part of induction regimen in low to middle income countries when compared to seven plus three. To see more patients here in this study, went through this therapy and they were still transplant eligible and they tolerated the therapy better. So that was very encouraging. That said, seven plus three remains the preferred option, especially in fit and good risk patient population. While for intermediate poor risk, worth considering Azaven, though long-term data is very much needed, this could still be a possibility for induction in FLT3 and NPM1 wild type. While talking on this combination of HMA Ven, a key question that we asked Dr. Uma Barade during our satellite symposium, which was not recorded, so I want our audience to still know on how to adapt this. Is paradigm study paradigm shifting today? I think it is paradigm changing, but not yet, not immediately. I think we are gonna be heading that way. I'm not gonna treat my next fit patient with AML tomorrow with, with, with this regimen. But I think that that's where we're going to be heading. It's particularly interesting in the context of these triplet combinations that we're using with these targeted agents, where we worry about other toxicities. Perhaps it has a role because we don't have to do the three plus seven and so on. So I do think it's going to change the paradigm. When we have this conversation in, I don't know, three or five years, I think we're going to be talking about that as the standard of care. But I don't think we're ready yet to do it on the next patient. 
What we also saw at ASH 2025 was real world evidence of shortened course of venetoclax with decitabine. And this is for newly diagnosed AML, which could be an option for transplant ineligible patient population. Jorge, we have been using this venetoclax-based regimen. We shortened the course from 28 to 21 or even 14 days to manage our cytopenias better once we have seen that marrow response. The data does suggest modified schedules still have good efficacy here. What are we learning from what we saw here? I think what we were learning is that we still have to figure out the optimal dose because it is a very effective regimen, but it is very myelosuppressive, particularly when using it for unfit patients. A serious infection can, can affect those patients particularly bad. There may be, depending on where you are, blood bank issues and shortages. Myelosuppression is not an insignificant problem. If you can shorten the courses, as you described, you know, little by little, we've been working on not going with a full regimen as per label, but shortening it, where is the right balance? I think we're still learning. There's been a French study with 7 plus 7, 7 of ASA and 7 of VEN. Now, this is with the cytobine, so it's 5 days of the cytobine and 10 days of VEN. They both look like they're good regimens. These are single-arm studies, more of a retrospective look. I, I don't think these become standard right now, but it is evident that we probably don't need the full right. schedule for every patient, particularly the most uh, fragile patients. You know, at least out in the community settings, this data is very reassuring because as Hora, you touched on this as well. This is HMA with venetoclax is not the easiest combination, yeah. be it cytopenia or other side effects that we run into. So getting better at managing these side effects, either by changing the duration or the dose ends up being important on our end. Before moving on to CML, here at ASH 2025, we also saw data with Azaven being combined with menin inhibitors. Just before ASH, we saw two menin inhibitors get approved. Ziftomenib and Revumenib. You know, the activity here as single agent for these menin inhibitors is modest, but we all are eagerly waiting to see data around combination trials in refractory settings or upfront settings. For it, though this is early data and not ready for prime time, what can we say about the combination trials for menin inhibitors? As you mentioned, the single agent activity is encouraging because we didn't have anything specific for these drugs, but it was, you know, CRCRH in the refractory relapse in the 20, mid-20s range. So good in terms of proof of principle and showing biologic activity, but we want more. In two settings, uh, you know, of course, for the salvage patients, the, the refractory relapse patients, gee, I mean, 25%, we, we, we hope we can improve that. But then on the newly diagnosed, and this group of patients is important because it's a common mutation. We see it in about 30% of the patients. It's not a full prognosis unless it has three mutations concomitantly. You need to really demonstrate that there is benefit. The responses on this study are very attractive. Almost 90% overall response rate. It was very well tolerated. You get less differentiation syndrome, which is one of the main concerns with these drugs, when you combine it with chemotherapy, you see less of that. It was, you know, one, two percent on these uh, combinations. So it is attractive. Evidently, for these to become standard, we're going to need to go head to head with just the chemo right. alone and see, is it better than that? What I suspect is that uh, it may improve probably not so much the response rate, but the duration of response and MRDs and those kind of things. But again, we're going to need confirmation for that. Indeed, we'll have to wait on how the combination plays out in long term, especially with a stronger comparator arm, though this was only phase one. Jorge, we also saw data on NPM1 mutation or KMT2A rearrangement in relapsed refractory setting with combination hma ven What did we learn from this? Well, this is, this is more attractive because we already know what Zipto by itself can do as a single agent. That's how it's approved today. But we were talking about modest responses, and here you see that with the combination, you increase significantly. Overall response rate was about the CRCRH only about in the 20s, overall response rate in the 30s. And, and here you have an overall response rate almost double that in the mid 60s, and not with a whole lot more toxicity. So this is encouraging. And I think that these may be a better way to treat these patients once right. you get into that refractory relapse. 
again, this is not the standard yet, but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised that these moves to become standard certainly sooner than the frontline uh, combinations. All right, let's move along into the CML space where we have few options starting out with our first generation imatinib and then moving into third and fourth generation with recent approval of Asiminib, where we are seeing deeper molecular remissions with our third, fourth generation TKIs here. Here at ASH, what we saw was updates on ASK for patient-related outcomes, and we also saw data around ASK to escalate, which we will dive into shortly, where Asiminib was used as a second-line treatment in phase two study. Jorge, can you touch on these studies and their findings, please? Sure. So the, the patient-reported outcomes, as you mentioned, comes from the frontline study that led right. to the approval. And with Asiminib, we think the potential benefit could be twofold, deeper responses so that hopefully more patients can get to treatment-free remission. So far, the response rate has been encouraging. We need longer follow-up for the treatment-free remission. But the other one is because the safety profile of Asimilib has been very good. And realistically, probably most patients are going to live with the medication for a long time or the rest of their life. So what is the impact on quality of life and the importance of these patient reported outcomes? And what we see in this report, the patient reported outcomes were measured at baseline at week four and then at week 96. What we see is that there is generally improvements, and we know that with all TKIs, but the improvement is significantly greater with a seminib than with the comparator, whether it's imapinib or with the second generation TKIs. There were different uh, instruments used to measure the quality of life. Some are more symptom specific, others are more function specific, ability to work, ability to do activities of daily living, those kinds of things, as well as a global quality of life instrument. The improvement from baseline was better, and probably the best way to see it is by the global quality of life result, which was really a big difference. It may suggest that the patients uh, are going to have a better quality of life, which is a very welcome benefit for patients, certainly for those who are not going to be able to stop therapy. At least they can have a better life and not be affected by the drug. All right. Thank you so much for touching on that. Keeping that it's available in first line now, Asimina was approved last year in 2024, and the data that we're seeing deeper molecular remission and patient-reported outcomes. Here at Ask to Escalate, we're using Asimineb in second line, a phase two study. Should this be sequenced? Should it be used upfront? What can we learn from this particular study? As you mentioned, the studies that led to the approval, we talked about the front line just a minute ago, and the initial study was a third line versus bosutinib. Second line was included in the approval because, you know, if it works first and third, then it should work in second, but we didn't have data. So, so that's the important thing about this study, that it tells us the outcome in patients that receive second line. It is important because although Asimnib is a great option for many patients as initial therapy, the reality is that many patients are going to be taking imatinib or second generation. These are all good drugs. Learning the role also in that second line is important. And we saw very good results. The primary endpoint, which was the, the major molecular response at, at 48 weeks, was almost 60%. So, so very, very good results in this setting. The majority of these patients, by the way, the initial TKI had been either imatinib or dasatinib, which are probably the most commonly used in general practice as initial therapy. And the responses were similar whether the patient had received imatinib or dasatinib. So it's reassuring to see that in the second line, you have a drug that can give you a very high level of response. The safety profile in, in second line was pretty much the same as in first line, so well tolerated. It, it just expands our options for the patients and allows us to better fit the best option in each line of therapy based on the patient characteristics, the disease characteristics, et cetera. Clearly, Asimineb is an active drug, but when it comes to CML, that upfront discussion with our patients around MRD, treatment-free interval, financial toxicity, and side effects have to be at the center of all this when we're checking that TKI and then sequencing these available options. Jorge, before we close, any final thoughts from ASH 2025? Well, it's very exciting to see the pace of the advances that we're seeing in hematologic malignancies in general. In leukemia, for years, we didn't make any progress. And now every year we get a new target, a new drug, a new advance. And this is resulting in better 
outcomes for patients, whether it's responses, safety, et cetera, it is very exciting and good that we can have better options to offer to our patients. All right. Thank you so much for this incredible conversation and walking us through some key studies in AML and CML from ASH 2025. For those tuning in, let's do a quick recap. In this episode with Dr. Jorge Cortez, we walked through a few important studies from ASH 2025 in AML and CML. The Paradigm trial showed that azacitidine plus venetoclax can improve event-free survival and response rates compared with intensive 7 plus 3 induction in functionally fit, transplant-eligible adults with newly diagnosed AML. But let's be cautious before we completely abandon 7 plus 3, as this was a phase 2 study. Larger and more mature data would confirm these findings. Rohit, we touched on other studies around HMA Venn combo as well in AML. Your thoughts? Right, Rahul. You're seeing a lot more combination trials in refractory settings and even in upfront setting with combination, where we touched on menin inhibitors combined with HMA venetoclax. This is all in early phases. Before this can be broadly adapted in clinical practice, we will have to see longer term outcomes. We also touched on real world data around venetoclax dosing being around 21 days rather than 28 days without compromising outcomes. These truncated dosing provides better tolerability for our patients with same efficacy. Rahul, what do you want to add for CML? Yeah, Rohit, on the CML side, we touched on ask for first, which showed favorable patient reported outcomes around long term tolerability and quality of life with Asimineb. We also touched on the data from Isimineb in second line based off ask to escalate study. We have to keep what is important to the patients in front of us in mind while managing side effects, including financial toxicity that come along with these agents. Thank you all for tuning in. Make sure to check out our other episodes for treatment algorithms, recent approvals, and more conference highlights. We are the Oncology Brothers.